Hi, I'm Lou Doyon, and you're watching MB. Hey, everyone, it's Alicia from MB, and I'd like to welcome you to our interview with Lou Doyon. Welcome. Well done. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I know you got into Toronto yesterday. You've been spending a little time. Can you just walk us through your last 24 hours in our lovely city? Yeah, I arrived, uh, yeah, last night. Was it? No, I think it was like uh, afternoon, I guess. Uh, but the time we got to the hotel was a bit late. And uh, um, I let the boys kind of go and have a beer. And I uh, did a bit of yoga to try and stretch out all of my you know, bloody hours on the plane. And then um, I wanted soup, so we've walked and walked and walked and we found a faux place that was lovely, not too far from here. Okay. So I had a divine faux soup and then uh, walked a bit in the streets and went back to bed because was the jet lag, it was slightly violent. And this morning um, took me actually more than 45 minutes to find a place to have bacon and eggs. Really? Yeah, everything was just, you know, all about pastries or granola. And I was like, no, no, I want bacon and eggs. <laughs> you got a hearty breakfast. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Finally found one, then uh, jumped in a tram, um, went to your crazy tower, managed oh, yeah? uh, to... Um, get tickets to get to the top and then to the second top so that made my heart kind of leap because I'm frightened of heights oh but really? it was it was a challenge especially on that bloody glass floor <laughs> but I made it you did you have a kid jumping on it beside you I had a Chinese man jumping next to me on it and I was like please don't don't do that so I just sat down and I you know tried to look away but at least I, I fought my way through and then um, I found a place to have oysters for lunch and uh, and so, no, it, it's been great on the move. And then again, another tram to come back. And then the sun came out. So that was divine. And and then here we are. Yeah, well, we're glad to have you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Before this North American run, you were actually over in Australia and Japan. Yep. Saw a photograph of you holding this adorable baby koala. Yeah. yeah. Can you tell me a bit about your adventures over there? Well, it was, uh, we went there to, we did a couple of dates and uh, and by the third date over there, not having run into a kangaroo or koala, I thought, you know, I just can't do an Australian <laughs> tour and not see one. So desperately, I found, uh, I looked on the internet and I found um, a kind of <laughs> koala resort. So I thought, right, that's where I'm going to go. And, um, you know, you do the queue. And you give a buck, that's how the, the place lives off the money they take from you holding a koala. So it's a bit pathetic and strange, but once you have him in your arms, you just don't want to let him go. <laughs> and it's just, they're quite heavy, they've got massive nails, but uh, no, it was divine. And I had a very kind of modelish one, because all the band did it, and they had little ones that were really sweet. My one kind of like looked back at the camera and was... <laughs> kind of knew Some he was sass. yeah yeah he was he was a funny koala i forgot he had a great name he wasn't called nelson but he had a great name it will come back <laughs> <laughs> but so that's why we so that that night i could perform and say that i had a koala in my arms that day and i lied down with a kangaroo which was very funny and we did a selfie so there you go it was a kind of crazy day and a wonderful um evening with the audience so uh, no no it's been lucky that's it's fantastic been lucky. yeah you posted some photographs of you driving in the van from place to place and listening to music often yeah which tunes get you through those long van rides it depends. It, we always kind of counterbalance. Um, we've got an obsession because it's been the same album we've been listening to since the start of the two, three, uh, tour three, four years ago now, um, which is Paul McCartney's Ram. That the whole album just makes us, you know, love each other very, very much. So, <laughs> so we're all nesting one next to the other, and then we're like, oh, it's so that's the one we love. And uh, and otherwise, we listen to loads of stuff. Everyone has different playlists, and everyone has, you know, moments of, of peak when we're super tired. Someone will always pull out a, you know, a in excess or a banana rama to kind of get everyone a bit pissed off in the van and have <laughs> massive points of view. I can pull, you know. Uh, um, Guns N' Roses to get everyone very angry in yeah. the band. So there, we have ways of waking up uh, the rest of the band, <laughs> of making them smile, of... Because uh, if you put good music that we all love, we tend to fall asleep. So so we get into, yeah, music fights. To rile you up, I guess. <laughs> yeah. It's like when you're with your family in the car and you have the iPod and you're trying to choose who's picking what. <laughs> Absolutely. I can go for things that I love, but suddenly everyone's like, God, you know, I can sing through Hurricane of Bob Dylan, but that's on a very long drive because I can pull off seven minutes of just like ranting at the front of the car and they're all like, she's doing it again. But it's, uh, no, no, I, I love that. And then, yeah, there's there's loads of sung, of course, Har 
George Harrison kind of, you know, makes us all love each other also. I mean, so, yeah, we're, we're very sweet teddy bears. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're now touring because of Lalo. Yeah. Latest record release. It's just such a heartfelt record. I love it. I was Thank wondering, you. since you've now been able to pretty much tour test it and you've been bringing it out on the road, which songs are resonating the most with you right now? It's funny because there's very different ones where I, I loved when I was, uh, when I wrote it. Um, I was um, I was very fond of Worth Saying, which no one was more than that obsessed by. And then when I recorded the album, I was really happy of how we had done it. And again, everyone was like, mm, yeah, okay. And, and I'm very happy that live, it has this kind of life where everyone's getting souped into it. And I'm like, see, I, told, I could <laughs> feel it. <laughs> no one could feel it, but I could feel it back then. So um, that one has, has something going on. It, it's, they're very different and for very different reasons. It's funny to see how the, f um, the first album suddenly manages to, to have room in the second album, which is always um, kind of a challenge where you don't want to do albums that just don't go together at all and to do weird sets where you know you, m you mix your past and that it kind of collides. There it actually um, works. And there's, yeah, um, the song Lalo is great to do live because uh, I don't have many dancey songs where you know, I can get people to, to <laughs> be happy. <laughs> Otherwise, I tend to, to get them down, but with a smile, which is maybe the worst technique in the world, where you're like, let's go down <laughs> together with a smile. But so, yeah, that one makes people um, happy, which is good. And, uh, you know, it depends. It depends on the audience. I know that in Japan, for example, that uh, I have a song called Jealousy, which is a song on the first album, which depending on the place, if it's at a festival, seems very kind of cabaret and strange to perform. There it was great. We were in a sitting cabaret with, you know, 600 Japanese people who were all feeling it. And I was like, yeah, this song. And, <laughs> and the guy I work with, Guillaume, came and he was like, this song was meant to be played here. And you're like, who would have thought that in a, the Blue Note kind of Japanese cabaret, that song resonated. So it's lovely to go on a tour to kind of find, you know, the places that suit one song in particular. Wow. Do you have any kind of thoughts on which will stick out for Toronto tonight? I wonder. I was wondering when I was up on stage. I wonder. It's, uh, well, I'll see later on, but it's, it's, I love playing in clubs. There's something very, uh, um, it's closer to my kitchen than a big festival is. And uh, there was something very beautiful that um, David Byrne wrote on how music works, where he said that in a way, completely subconsciously, where you write a song and and how you think a song is often the place where the song should be performed yeah. and that and it's true that when you think of you know of queen i don't think they were writing it in a kitchen thinking that it should have been that big i think they had an ambition of a stadium while they were writing it in a way and i've never had <laughs> that kind of ambition i have a maybe a club ambition and so it feels at home when i'm in places like here I came across this quote you shared, and it was pretty much about how people perceive you. Oh, it's like a lot crazier than you actually are, but you wish you were crazier. Yeah. What's one of the craziest things to happen to you on this tour run so far? Um, I don't know. I guess um, the whole thing for me is absolutely crazy. To, to, to go to places where it's a full house, places you've never been in your entire life and didn't even know anyone would show up you know like south korea where you think you know i don't know anyone in south korea and suddenly it, it's full and suddenly you have people who know your songs who know you obviously and and uh what was great was that there's a song called left behind which is a kind of you know of um, a song more on the downside than on the happy side. And so it's a song where in France um, or throughout the world, because I, I talk before uh, the song and kind of introduce it and it's got this heavy background. People, you know, some people cry, other people just like hug. And, and in South Korea, I don't know why, in Seoul, people started crying of laughter. Uh. And at first, I was on the, um, the piano thinking, you know, what the hell is going on? And my band do the voices on the side. They go like, mm, and it's, you know, kind of beautiful. And, and I guess that for them, it was the funniest thing they had ever seen. And really? they were just roaring of laughter. And it was so unexpected that I looked at my band thinking, I'm going to kill you. Because I thought <laughs> someone had pulled out his dick or something, you know, because it shouldn't have been. I mean, it's, it's a bizarre and moment. crying of laughter. And we left stage saying, what happened? And, and my band were like, we didn't do anything, we swear. And we don't know. You still don't know to this day? No. We don't know if they have a kind of comic thing on TV where we resembled them at one point. Or if I don't, I don't know why. Or maybe, you know, it's grotesque for them to have three people on the same mic going, mm, I don't 
know. So but it was genius because never, never, ever should it have happened or, or would I have <laughs> imagined it happening. And so there, those are the moments that I like the most. Funny things where you just don't understand why, but it's a kind of culture clash, but in, in the best way. <laughs> Going back to you mentioning kitchens there for a moment, so you posted something where you were doing these model buildings in your kitchen as yeah. like a craft. Yeah. How did you get into those? Because I've seen a few of those throughout your feed. Oh, I've, I've always, I love doing stuff and, and I love doing things with my hand and I find that it's, uh, um, I've always done that. I've always been obsessed by any craft and I get very, very... Um, uh, neurotic about it so as soon as I see you know I fall asleep watching people make stuff and uh, it's quite horrifying for the person who lives with me but he's <laughs> used to it I can fall asleep watching <laughs> factories of candies for example till four o'clock in the morning I'm just like wow but I didn't know that's how they did gummy bears <laughs> and it's just and then I want to do them and I'm so the I will buy way. everything and I will be in my house and because I'm a bit of a neurotic Virgo I actually managed to do so so there I found this insane model in Japan and I love um, I I used to do planes and boats when I was younger and, and it was all my cousins, boys who used to do it who were like, oh, it's a boy thing. And I was like, move up, you know, with all my little things. And I mean, I can paint with a needle. <laughs> I've, got a, <laughs> I've got a magnifying glass for grannies that, you, that actually rests on your breast to be able to do needlework. And I can draw like that, you know, it's, it just goes on and on. That, I found it. And on top of it, it's all written in Japanese. So when I opened it in Paris, I thought, Oh, that's a hard one because actually it's a model where half of the things are missing in it and you have to build them by yourself. <laughs> oh, no. Thank God we lived in a such fucked up world that you can hit the, that, the name of a thing where everything's in Japanese but there's just one thing called, I can't remember what it was called, and I found a tutorial of a guy on YouTube <laughs> Who doesn't speak? Who it's for a tutorial 26 of everything. for 26 minutes? The guy is doing the thing, and now, of course, I fall asleep watching that guy do stuff because that and miniature Japanese food, which doesn't make any sense. They, there's actually a site of people who make food that big. And they do tiny weeny pancakes in tiny weeny kitchens where there is a real oven and everything for real. And you see huge fingers do tiny fries and tiny burgers Jeez. and miniature sushis. And my father's horrified. Last time he was like, you know there's something wrong about you when you're looking at miniature sushis all night. I was like, I don't, you know, better that than killing people, I guess. So that's, that's what I do. But so, yeah, right now I'm into modeling. I'm into... Um, I'm dying to buy one, but they're very expensive, so I thought I was going too far to, um, um, how do you call them, where you have to go, <laughs> this was your foot to... Oh, like the pot yeah. pottery things? Oh, or? I want one. Okay. But my house resembles, I mean, it, my house is a joke now. I've got everything where people can come in and be like, do you have, you know, a glue gun, but a black glue gun? And you're like, mm-hmm, yes, I do. <laughs> do you have something to be able to draw on it? Mm-hmm, yes, I do. So I've got everything just in case. <laughs> it's very bad. I'm very non. I love you know. that though. <laughs> Obviously, a very creative person. Well, I have to do stuff, and my, you know, my poor son. I take the fun away. He has his Legos and he starts playing and I'm like, wait, let's organize it color by color. Let's clean the whole table. To, and he's like, okay, you do the Legos. And, you just, and I'm like, I've been up for six hours. So, yeah, children hate me, but, you know, at least they'll know how to do perfect Legos. <laughs> you pass that on to them when they're older. Look, it's perfect. I actually see him now bully younger kids where he's like, that's not how you do it. You separate the colors. And I'm like, oh, God, it comes from me. <laughs> Well, I love asking this question specifically to people, um, but I've never asked someone to, from Paris. So if we were to come with and hang out with you for a day in Paris, France, where would you take us? Ooh, well, um, <laughs> in my house where we could make stuff. And if you were, didn't want to make stuff, then uh, I love to, to walk. Paris is one of those great cities where you can walk all around. And, and because I'm a history freak, I could kind of take you on a on a gore tour i love to be able to say so that's where the guillotine was and that's where <laughs> see all those bourgeois who are very happy to be there little do they know that 200 years ago their heads were on pikes so i could make you a kind of um yeah french revolution tour and otherwise great bars very very funny places that uh, play great music because because uh, it's actually quite hard in in paris to find um, yeah, we're, we're stuck with all the hype places in a stupid way. So it's hard to find places that are, you know, neither super hype and snob, nor just crummy. So there's kind of <laughs> a few places, but one called Le Fanfaron, which is amazing. It's a little bar not far from my house where 
if you go in there, I can't guarantee in what state you'll leave that place, even for non-drinkers, just to, just the air <laughs> at this point <laughs> will get you wasted. So, uh, no, yeah, we could do loads of stuff. Awesome. <laughs> well, just to wrap things up today, for your fans who are going to be viewing the interview, anything you want to say or shout out to them all? Oh, God, uh, what a terrible pressure. No, do whatever you want and, and only listen to yourself and uh, be honest. That's a good thing in life. Be honest, keep the ones you love around you, and uh, and you only live once. So do what you got to do and do it well. <laughs> like, do Legos perfectly every single time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. I'm so glad Thank we you. could do this. Thank you very much. It's my much. pleasure. <laughs> and remember, everyone viewing, you can visit us at amusicblogger.com for exclusive interviews, features, videos, and so much more with your favorite artists. We'll see you next time. Bye.